Hello, I'm Sam Pearl, and this is The Art of Deal Making. Joining me today is Mike Moyer, adjunct faculty at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business and author of Slicing Pie. Mike, thanks for coming today. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Mike, to start things off, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about your professional history. Well, I've been an entrepreneur. I've gone back and forth between startup companies and sort of real jobs throughout my career. My first company I started was back in college. Um, it was a manufacturing company that made jackets and things like North Face fleece jackets to compete with companies like North Face and Patagonia. Uh, I sold that company after I graduated from graduate school. Um, and then I went into doing startup stuff. I went back and forth between startup companies and more established companies. I've been working in every industry from vacuum cleaners to motorhome chassis to financial data services to fine wines. And uh, throughout my career, I've always looked for opportunities to change the way people are doing things or thinking about things. And uh, I've always had an interest in entrepreneurship. So today I manage a company called Lake Shark Ventures. I do early stage growth, uh, growth consulting, revenue generation sales programs, things like that, and early stage investing for proof of concept types of things. I have a technology team and uh, we build minimally viable products and things like that. And then a big focus of my efforts are on these equity splits and helping sort of evangelize the power of dynamic equity splits. What inspired you to write Slicing Pie? Well, like many entrepreneurs, I've bootstrapped a lot of companies, I've gone into a lot of tech companies, and I haven't had a lot of cash to put into companies, especially early in my career. And the negotiation equity split discussion was always kind of a stressful one. And I had one situation a few years ago. I started a company called Blipnut. And I actually found a technical co-founder. I split the equity. If you talked about it, we split the equity 35%, 65%. I was going to keep 65% as kind of the marketing guy. And the guy never produced anything. So for months went by, I never did anything. And I finally had to kind of negotiate the equity back. He sort of left the company. There was no software. So I hired another technical co-founder, and I gave him 75% of the equity to do this. I was like, this, we've got to do this thing. It's going to be great. And I'm okay with a small percentage because it's going to change things so much. It's a big job. And he did the whole thing in two weeks. So here I was, two weeks later, I'd given him 75% of the equity for doing what turned out to be kind of a small job, and now I had to market this thing. And I wanted to bring on some marketing help, and he thought that equity, because it was marketing and not development, should come out of my 25%. So we never agreed on what that should be, and the company went out of business as a result. We couldn't ever get to an agreement where I was properly motivated to work. And this happens all the time. It's happened before my career. It'll happen again in my career, I'm sure. And well, now, now I do it differently now. But most people face this problem. This, this equity decision is so, it's such a paralyzing decision. What do you get? What do I get? Can I maintain control of my company? And the problem is that most of the time we base our equity split decisions on future promises. I come in and you give me, I say I'm going to do a great job for you, so you give me 10%. Or uh, we're going to be partners, so we go in 50-50. There's, there's always this fixed equity split, this, this discussion based on what we might produce in the future. And I knew there was a better way to do it, and uh, that's why I came up with this concept. It's called the Grunt Fund, and it's a dynamic equity split, which grants equity over time based on the actual contributions versus the uh, possible contribution or the promises of contributions. In your book, you draw a very stark distinction between static and dynamic equity splits. How do dynamic equity splits prevent future problems in businesses? In order to get the dynamic, any split right, you need two pieces. The first thing is you need a framework for the allocation of equity. How does someone get equity in your company? How do they deserve equity in your company? The second piece you need is a framework for the recovery of equity. So when you separate from an employee or a partner or an investor, how do you get that equity back? And those are the two biggest struggles people have. Um, people often worry about the allocation of equity, but they rarely think about the recovery of equity. What a dynamic split does is it allocates equity based on the actual contributions of an individual versus the future contributions of an individual. So um, it self-adjusts over time to make sure it's always fair. So what I do is I, I, the basic premise is everything has a fair market value. And that's the amount of money you're risking when you start for a, work for a startup company. So when you work for a startup company, the risk is very specific that you're not going to get paid for your contribution. So if my contribution is time, there's a very good chance I'm not going to get paid for my time. If my contribution is supplies, there's a very good chance I'm not going to get paid for those supplies. If I put in cash, there's a very good chance I'm not going to get that money back. So my risk that I'm experiencing as an entrepreneur is the risk that I'm not going to get paid the fair market value for that contribution. So that's where I start. I use a calculation that accounts for the risk, for the, uh, provides a risk premium. And an individual share, therefore, is equal to the value of their contribution divided by the contributions of everybody. 
And every day those contributions change, the model changes over time. And using that basic model, you always keep a very fair equity split. So no matter what I contribute to the company versus what you contribute versus what anybody contributes, it's always perfectly fair. And uh, the second piece is this recovery framework. There are different circumstances under which people can leave a company. You can get fired for not doing your job. You can quit because you want to work somewhere else. I can fire you for no reason whatsoever because I don't like working with you anymore even though you're doing your job. Or I can change something about your job that gives you sort of justification to quit. Those are four very different scenarios and they, have, they deserve different treatments. So in my book, Slicing Pie, I outline how equity should be treated or recovered in those scenarios. For instance, if you get fired for not doing your job, you're sort of leaving the company in the lurch. So you lose a lot of your rights to equity. If I fire you for no reason, I am putting you in a position that's not fair. So I, as, a, as a company, I have to give you that you keep the equity, the, kind of the full face value for, of it. So um, it builds in sort of protection for the employee and the company. Are there any tools out there for entrepreneurs to help them employ the type of model that you're talking about? Yes, it's interesting. Um, the book came out about two years ago, and there have been several companies that have developed sort of online calculator tools. I, I publish a spreadsheet on my website, slicingpie.com. It's got lots and lots of downloads. Um, a few folks created tools to manage it for you, and I'm coming out with a tool, too. Uh, too. It's called the Pie Slicer, and it basically allows you to track your contributions, what you put in time and investment and cash and things like that and it'll calculate the slices of the pie you get uh, in real time. And then if you decide to terminate somebody, it'll calculate how you get rid of somebody as well and what the buyout price would be appropriate in that situation. So um, it's going to be coming out this year. It's called uh, the Slicing Pie Pie Slicer, and it's, uh, it's a tool that I make available to my readers. What are the legal and tax implications of your model? Well, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a CPA, but I get this question a lot. And I actually had an attorney called me stupid to my face and said, this plan is idiotic, it'll never work from a tax standpoint. And then a couple of weeks later, he bought a copy for everyone in his law firm to read because he was so excited about the, the model. So, um, and one of my biggest legal supporters was a guy who wrote an article about why this wouldn't work from a tax standpoint. And he became one of the, the biggest proponents of it and from an implementation standpoint. I sent him a lot of readers. Um, so there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. It's perfectly legal. And there's a number of attorneys on my, law, on my website that uh, have written agreements to kind of govern this and do a sort of a partnership agreement. Uh, there's a couple of ways to handle taxes. Um, there's two major forms of company structures. There's an LLC and there's a C Corp. In a C Corp, when you issue equity to someone in exchange for, comp for, for doing work, you actually it's, it can be treated as a form of compensation. So what we typically do in that scenario is issue restricted shares in the beginning. So everyone will get, you know, 10,000 restricted shares. And then the slicing pie grunt fund agreement dynamic equity split would determine the vesting schedule. So at the first end of the first period, if you own 35% or 30% and I own 70%, I get seven shares and you get three. At the, at the end of the next period, um, we're 50-50 given the split, then you get another four shares, so each have seven. So it vests according to that schedule. And that's how you handle the tax implications. You file what's called an 813B election or 83B election, which uh, solves that problem. In an LLC, it's much more fluid. You can give uh, equity or profit interest to anybody you want to. In fact, one of the things I really promote is rather than worrying about the underlying equity piece, the ownership piece, to worry more about the profit interest. What we really care about as an entrepreneur or a co-founder is that you'll get paid. Um, usually the founders or the, you know, the, the co-founder partners want to maintain control, and they can do that by owning all the equity, but by promising profit interest to somebody else. So the dynamic equity split can be basically a dynamic profit sharing split. So when we sell the company, if you get revenues or profits, or we sell the company, the distribution of the proceeds would be according to the split. So one thing I always want people to take away from that is there is a legal way to kind of paper the agreements between founders, and there is a tax solution um, for this thing in the United States. In other countries, there's actually groups forming to kind of handle this thing. In the Netherlands, they're actually trying to get legislation passed to accommodate dynamic equity split. There's a group in London, slicingpie.nl is the, Netherlands, the website for the Netherlands. The group is kind of taking care of that. There's a, there's a group in, in, in UK, uh, in Scotland and in the UK trying to, to work, work, on the, work on the tax issues there. Um, the book's been translated into several languages and the, the biggest problem is to solve the tax issues in the local venue. But um, I always tell people, rest assured, when it's perfectly fair, when the model is fair, there's a way to handle it, and, and, and you can always find a way to solve the problem. So if you speak to a lawyer or an accountant who 
dismisses the idea sort of wholesale. Let me know. I'd be happy to talk to those people or work with those people or send them a copy of the book. Once they get their head around what's going on, they often come up with their own solutions. So that's the most important thing to remember. Can you apply a dynamic equity split to an existing company? If you have a, a company that's already in business, you've been around, I call it a retrofit. And a retrofit retrofits the dynamic equity model to what you already have in place, your fixed equity split. So you basically sort of recreate the model, um, kind of recre recreating the past to see what your equity split is at any given time, and you move forward with a dynamic model. I call the people who work for startup companies grunts. And there's two kinds of grunts in a fixed equity model. There's a fat grunt, which is somebody who has more than they deserve, and a skinny grunt, which is someone who has less than they deserve. Skinny grunts are always looking for ways to get equity back from the fat grunts. Fat grunts are less likely to do that. In the book, I have a documented way to retrofit the grunt fund. I actually have letters written directly pointed at the fat grunts to explain why their position is problematic for the company. If you are a member of the team and you have more than you deserve, you're going to be resented by your team members. If you're someone who has less than you deserve, you're going to be demotivated by participating in the company. So when the equity split is out of balance, you're going to have hard feelings between founders, and that causes a lot of problems, um, often insurmountable problems. I mean, founder disputes, sometimes equity splits are at the core of founder disputes. Um, so getting things back in balance is very important. So most people who read my book are people who already are in a company or have been burned by a company, and so the chapter on retrofits really helps them kind of work that, that agreement out and figure out what it should be. Sometimes people find that they're in pretty close, kind of spitting range of where they should be and things are okay. Other times they, they know instinctively that they're out of balance. You know, typically a founder will think their idea is so great they'll keep 95% of the business for themselves and give 5% to their co-founders. That doesn't make sense logically to someone who has some experience in, the, in startups that, that that kind of balance would be problematic. So the retrofit will tell you exactly what it should be and how to keep it that way. To finish things off, I'd like you to give me the number one lesson that any business owner can take away from your book. The most important thing is to have a genuine interest in starting fair and being fair. You know, there's all kinds of situations you can get into, your, into yourself that, 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 aren't, aren't, that aren't fair. Uh, I was with a company not long ago where I had signed an agreement, an employment agreement and an operating agreement and an amendment to the operating agreement and everything else, so plenty of legal documentation. And the partner uh, sort of pushed me out of the company and I had the rights to fully vested shares as a result of his decisions, which was what he agreed to, what I agreed to, uh, which seemed fair given the circumstances of the dismissal, of the separation. So I vested in my stock. And then several years, several weeks later, he called up and said, oh, by the way, you signed an operating agreement amendment a few years ago that allows me to buy back all the stock at face value, which is zero today, so I'm taking back the majority of your stock. And then one by one, he pushed out other senior managers and did the same thing to them. Now, he was perfectly within his legal right to do that, but it wasn't fair. Just because something's legal doesn't make it fair. And I think people lose sight of this a lot. They, they, they try to figure out what they can get away with but it doesn't necessarily mean it's fair. So I always call slicing pie a moral agreement, not a legal agreement. It's about doing right by the people who help you get to where you want to go. So I always want people to keep in mind that the ultimate way to work with your team is to make sure you're treating everybody fairly and in a transparent way and treating everybody the same. And the minute you take a chunk for yourself or give a chunk to somebody else, you make it less fair. So keeping a dynamic equity split open and transparent and, and fluid for all the participants is the only way really to make sure that you give people what they deserve to get from your company. Mike, thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.